Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian Life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst in Cape Cod. Every Who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot, but the Grinch, who lived just north of Whoville, did not. The Grinch hated Christmas, the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. Whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, he stood there on Christmas Eve hating the Who's, staring down from his cave with a sour, grinchy frown at the warm, lighted windows below in the town. For he knew every Who down in Whoville beneath was busy now hanging a mistletoe wreath, and they're hanging their stockings, he snarled with a sneer. Tomorrow is Christmas, it's practically here. Then he growled with his Grinch fingers nervously drumming. I must find some way to stop Christmas from coming. This week on the podcast, we wanted to show you that there is absolutely nothing you can't apply a Jungian lens to. And so we're going to be putting the Grinch on the couch and talking about this wonderful poem written by Dr. Seuss uh, and explore what it might have to reveal to us psychologically. That poor, misunderstood Grinch, (laughs) isolated, cast out, looking strangely different from the Who's and misunderstood. It's, It's heartbreaking, isn't it? You're, I'm you're being feeling, sarcastic. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, but there is that element. But right? there is, right? Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. There is something really pathetic about the isolation and misery of Mr. Grinch. Mm-hmm. And that that's all he has. You know, his heart was two sizes too small. So the only thing he can do is spoil it for the who's. That's all he has, and that's envy. So before we dig further in, I want to just recap the story very quickly in case there are any listeners who haven't been exposed to this. Um, So Joseph just read the first uh, couple of pages of the book, and of course there's also a really well-known animated movie, and we're going to be referring to the book and the animated movie. There was a live-action movie a couple of years ago that I've never seen, but I imagine it's pretty different from the, the original animated movie or the book. So the Grinch, as you heard, hates Christmas, and he uh, feels all of this spoiling envy for uh, the Who's down in Whoville who are getting ready to celebrate in style. 
He decides that he's going to stop Christmas from coming. So he decides to dress up as Santa Claus and he has a dog named Max that he is going to equip to be a reindeer. And then they're going to go down into Whoville and take all of the Christmas trees, all of the food, all of the presents, all of the stockings. He's going to completely take away every physical trapping of Christmas in the hopes that that will stop Christmas. I, we're going to talk about the ending of the of the story later. So I think I'll just uh, mm. leave you leave you there in suspense if you don't know how it ends. But we might suspect that it ends happily ever after. <laughs> we just might. <laughs> that might be a possibility. You'll have to wait and see. But yes, Deb, you were you were talking about yeah. envy. I want to go back and pick pick up that thread. That envy comes from if I can't have it, if I can't feel happy, if I can't feel like I belong, if I don't have uh, company and joy then one thing I can do, the only thing I can do is a wreck it for the who's in the case of the Grinch. And there's a kind of helplessness and hopelessness that I think undergirds envy of I can't get it for myself. So I can, but what I can do is take it away from you, which makes me wonder about the Grinch's early family life and uh, whether he has attachment issues uh, of some kind, um, or you know, some kind of very early trauma, emotional trauma. Well, we don't have an origin story for the uh, Grinch, but we certainly might suspect. <laughs> no family history here. I find myself thinking about envy, and the word envy derives from the Latin word invidia, which means non-sight. And in Dante's Divine Comedy, the envious labor under cloaks of lead, their eyelids sewn tight with leaden wire, suggesting that envy arises from or leads to a kind of blindness. And this deadness of lead. So there's something about the Grinch because he's unable to see the goodness and feeling rich joy and pleasure that the Who's down in Whoville experience. And one of the things that I guess all of us understand occasionally is that envy is excruciatingly painful. Jealousy can be empowering because people can often see something that they want for themselves and they get riled up and they want to go get it for themselves. But when someone is envious, they see something that they want or that they don't have and they experience a sense of excruciating psychological pain. Mm -hmm. And often they don't feel consciously that they want the envious thing. Yes. That's really deeply hidden. What they consciously feel is that that thing is hurting me and I need to go after it to stop it from hurting me. So it could be going after a person. It could be going after an object. And the primary way that they relieve their own pain is by proving to themselves that they can devalue the thing that's causing them pain. I, I think you said something that's so important, which is that uh, in a way, envy is unconscious. When, um, you know, developmentally, it, we all start out pretty much in a two-person relationship, uh, it, the, the mommy and me bond. And then comes along, you know, the, the famous uh, Oedipal thing where um, we get that mommy and daddy have a relationship and I'm shut out. And that's jealousy of, I want that. I want to be number one. I want to be the center of everybody's attention. But with, with envy, it's not known. Jealousy is in consciousness. Envy is just an unnamed, unknowable hurt that leads to the desire uh, to eradicate it completely. 
Well, I want to uh, jump in here too, because I really appreciate what you're both saying. And I think it's relevant to Envy's very close cousin resentment. Mm. And, and picking up on what you've both just said, when we see something that we don't have that someone else has, we may be aware of jealousy, and that often spurs us forward to try to get that thing. It's like, well, I want that too. Let me see if I can get that. Whereas with envy in what you said, Joseph, which I think is really uh, just spot on, is that we don't often allow ourselves to know that we want that thing. Oftentimes, envy comes, envy and resentment come from seeing that someone else has something that we want and the corresponding belief that we are not allowed to have it. Now, sometimes someone has something that we don't have that we want, and we really can't have it for whatever reason. But many times it's an inner injunction. You know, we just grew up believing that we would never have X. We have a strong belief that we're not supposed to have Y. And so instead of having this kind of natural, healthy process of feeling jealousy and then going after something, it's, it's really a repressed desire that's activated in envy and resentment. And, and Jung, uh, you know, said, said this really beautifully. He says, what is suppressed comes up again in another place in altered form, but this time loaded with resentment that makes the otherwise natural impulse our enemy. So if we want to take this back and apply it to this wonderful poem, we might imagine that the Grinch has a natural impulse toward connection and harmony and uh, friendship and community and feeling, but that for whatever reason we don't exactly know has been suppressed. And now that suppressed impulse comes up in this other form of hating Christmas, which is in some sense the sort of pinnacle of all those things. And there's just poisonous resentment that comes along with it. You know, the sparks in me, uh, a pang of empathy for the Grinch, because what's missing for the Grinch and in Envy is uh, those feelings of belonging, of happiness, connection, community. You know, it's not about uh, the material things, but it's about a, a, a ground of emotional well-being that is missing and unknown. Uh, how hard that is. I think there's also a a context around envy where the circumstances play a big role. I think of the envy between Cain and Abel, that Cain, for all purposes, seems to be doing well enough. He's farming. Uh, Abel is a, a shepherd. There isn't a lot of story about conflict or strife, strife, but it's when Cain's offering is rejected, that when Cain is rejected and his capacity to please God is rejected, that envy and consequently murder then enters the world. So there's something about the gift that is rejected that creates a kind of archetypal wound in the psyche that then leaves us vulnerable to this kind of resentment, hatred, this impulse to do violence against the joy of those who have pleased, do violence against those who have left us isolated and alone. In the opening scenario, in the Grinches, he's living on top of Mount Crumpet in an icy cave, you know, with his beloved dog, so there's some redemptive moment there. But it begs the question is, why is the Grinch up on top of Mount Crumpet and the Who's, which, by the way, look very different from him and live differently, are all in this warm, singing community down in the valley? There is something about that separation 
that implies a kind of rejection. And the compensatory effort, uh, which of course is not at all successful, of, of going up high, of the superiority as an attempt to make up for what is, what is missing. And yes, he has a dog. Uh, dear little Max is, is really a, a, such a good, generous natured creature, but uh, the Grinch is terribly uh, unkind, bordering on abusive to little Max, who always goes all out uh, to satisfy the Grinch, including pulling the Grinch's sleigh um, in an attempt to um, make up for all the reindeer that poor little Max is not. You know, Joseph, you mentioned the gift that was rejected. And of course, the Grinch decides to deal with that by taking away other people's gifts. And he's not taking them to steal them. He's taking them to destroy, to destroy them. them. So nobody gets to have what he can't have. Exactly. The other thing that occurs to me as we were talking, if we were analyzing this like a dream, that the psyche includes both Grinch and and Max. That's right. Mm -hmm. That Max is an aspect of the Grinch that's been split off and diminished, but still holds a similar quality that Cindy Lou Who has, this quality of being small and innocent and emotional and vulnerable and good-willed and even attached to the Grinch. Yes. And, and now I think we're into this very important image of the heart that is two sizes too small. In some sense, the heart of the story is really about the feeling function and, and how it's been uh, devalued and treated very poorly. I think that, that, that uh, Max, as you were saying, Joseph, kind of holds that sense of the, the warmth of feeling and attachment I think you're right. It's important. It's there. You know, the heart, the heart's there. He has a heart. It's just too small. He has the dog. He's just treating him poorly. And we, we know that redemption is possible right from the beginning because of those two reasons. You know, it's worth saying here, I guess, you know, a couple of years ago, I think on the podcast, or maybe it was last year, we talked about um, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, and we talked about Scrooge's redemption. And of course, uh, the, the story of the Grinch is very similar to that story. And in both stories, it seems to me that the redemption has to do uh, with changing the power complex of the Grinch or Scrooge uh, into Eros, finding that loving, expansive place rather than trying to be dominating, uh, manipulative, greedy, controlling. I think in Scrooge, when the ghost of Christmas past takes him into his own childhood and returns him to a child state, the child who's alone at the boarding school, reading over Christmas break while everybody else is off, going to their families. His father won't allow him to come home. It's similar to Max. You know, this, this secret inner child that sits in a state of relentless hope, mm -hmm. which is a term that you had used previously, Deb, in other podcasts, and how relentless hope can both trap us and mesmerize us, but it also can poison us year after year of relentless hope can evoke a kind of bitterness and a turning away from the things that might be good and wholesome for us because we feel that they're constantly withheld or inaccessible for one reason or another. As the poem goes on and the Grinch is complaining, he says two things very strongly, that he hates the noise of their celebration, and he hates that they feast. They <laughs> feast, 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 feast. And then he lists all the th things that they're feasting on, the who pudding and the rare who roast beast, which the Grinch couldn't stand <laughs> in the least. 
so there's this whole litany of things, and I think importantly the noise, because the noise can travel from the valley mm. to the top of Mount Crumpet, and he can't keep it out. He can't keep it away from him. So it penetrates his neurotic isolation. He doesn't want even to know that joy is happening somewhere else. And when it does, it has this tremendous psychoactive effect on him. Even anticipating it. Even anticipating it or remembering it from previous years. And all of the the noise, which is basically the no- noise of joy and celebration, reminds him that he has not been invited. Mm-hmm. And in that way, he becomes the 13th fairy mm-hmm. in many fairy tales, who's the one that isn't invited to the christening and then consequently comes to curse and spoil. Well, yeah. well, but it's interesting because the Who's are so happy to include him. Who is responsible for the isolation? Well, perhaps and both is of it, them, yeah, actually. Is it sort of withdrawal, but yeah. And it's such a contrast between the abundance that the Who's have of all that noise of because they're singing and they're laughing and they're greeting one another. And then the abundance of the feasting really underscores our poor old Grinch's sense of deprivation. One of the things I think is interesting about those parts of the poem is, uh, and, and of course, you know, it gave Dr. Seuss a tremendous opportunity to to come up with all these fanciful things that they're these toys that they're playing or these things that they're eating. I think it shows a kind of rumination on the part of the Grinch Hmm. that he's just um, thinking and thinking in detail about all the things they're going to eat and all of the noises they're going to make and all of the presents they are going to unwrap. He's kind of tormenting himself ruminatively with all of these images. And it can be a little bit like, you know, if you're feeling low about yourself and you go on Instagram and you kind of torment yourself by looking at all of the images of people doing fabulous things or people looking beautiful or people getting together. And you you know it's just making you feel badly, but there's almost a kind of perverse pleasure in it, as there often is in rumination. So I, I see the Grinch as having an issue with rumination. I'm just going to come out and say it. Well, I think um, our effort here at um, diagnostic uh, acumen is really well worthwhile. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, what What I think is that um, this ties in with obsessive compulsive behavior uh, because his rumination actually activates him to take action. So he he harnesses poor little Max, and off he goes. And he scoops up every single thing he possibly can. Uh, Every gift, every tree, every wreath. And there is some place in the poem where he doesn't leave even a crumb that a mouse would find worth eating. It's truly obsessive. Uh, And he does have the libido to do this. Yeah, he's, it says, and the one speck of food that he left in the house was a crumb that was even too small for a mouse. Thorough. Gosh, I kind of wish he'd come and clean my house one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> the other um, thing I'd like to put on that moment has to do with the projective identification. Mm. That the Grinch is miserable uh, up there on Mount Crumpet. And then he's watching the Who's, or he's fantasizing about the Who's, really, at that point. And then he's imagining, well, what if they were the ones who were miserable? Mm-hmm. And, and then somehow he thinks that he would feel relieved if they were the ones who were miserable. And then he goes about with this plan, which he then enacts, that he's going to imaginatively insert this misery into the Who's, and then pressure them through stealing all their stuff to actually have them evidence the misery that he is carrying. And in his imagination, he would then experience this enormous sense of pleasure. And in the cartoon, he gets this enormous evil smile 
which is really the first time we see him have any sense of pleasure. So this is kind of the definition of projective identification is we defend against a feeling state that we can't tolerate by pressing other people to manifest it. And then we get a temporary reprieve. And he's in so much pain that he thinks that's a great idea. You know, I, I had someone come in uh, in the past week or so and, and share with me something that happened where she was uh, very excited because uh, she had sort of impulsively purchased tickets for the whole family, including her two young children, to go to see a production of the Nutcracker Ballet. And she was excited to do something as a family and uh, excited to share this with the kids. It was something she'd grown up doing. And she, you know, excitedly mentioned it to her husband. And he said, you know, well, what did you go and do that for? You know, we that that's a lot of money and I, I'm not going to want to stay out that late. <laughs> it was very Grinchish because it stripped the pleasure out of this gesture that she'd made. And uh, Joseph, I think, you know, along the lines of what you were saying, somehow, you know, I mean, I think her husband was just in a bad mood or something. And with him feeling kind of low and her feeling elated, he couldn't tolerate it. He needed, he needed her he needed to evacuate that feeling out of himself and have her hold it. So there are a couple of playful ways that we might analyze Mr. Grinch if he were our analysand, and we had him here on our Freudian couch. <laughs> that uh, There's a couple of things that he evidences. We've talked a little bit about projection, that he wants to project his own feelings of misery and disappointment onto the who's, and he fantasizes that when he's done with them, they would all cry boo-hoo upon discovering that he's ruined their Christmas, and that gives him a sense of relief of his own misery. Freud wrote about the death instinct and suggests that deep in the unconscious, human beings, or in this case, Grinches, <laughs> have a drive towards aggression and destruction. And when the death instinct is provoked, the Grinch has this enormous desire to destroy the Who's, destroy their goodwill, destroy their love of Christmas. And a Freudian might say that he has an unconscious desire for his own death, but rather than put himself at risk, he turns it against the Who's. And I remember as a young child watching the cartoon, and there's this moment where you know, that enormous sled is teetering just on the tip of this, you know, blood curdling cliff as he's, you know, getting ready to destroy these things. You know, Max is really anxious about what's happening, but the Grinch is just totally ready for all this to happen. And we can see that he's putting himself at enormous risk. The other Freudian idea has to do with oral aggression. It shows up with mm. sadism. Mm -hmm. And people whose libido is fixed in that oral stage and it gets particularly dark, it tends to make people feel very pessimistic and aggressive and hostile. And the reason it's associated with um, the oral stage is that it has a biting process. And interestingly enough, you can see the Grinch is constantly chewing on a toothpick in the oh, cartoon. Great. He's chomping and chomping and chomping with his teeth and grinding it around. And that's part of this unresolved psychosexual development. Mm. And then the last thing we might say from a Freudian standpoint is that he has an overacted id. And the id for uh, in the Freudian tradition has to do with the really primal instinctive level that is in some ways pre-human. So Grinch has all of these primal, biting, growling tendencies inside of himself. And he's also trying to reduce the tension around all of that darkness in himself. And the solution to manage his own instinct is to try to keep Christmas from coming, which is his declaration. 
if I can just block that one day from really blossoming, then his ego is less likely to be overwhelmed by this ferocious primal part of his psyche, which leaves him particularly anxious. So what I'm aware of here is that um, we're really talking about early developmental trauma. We're talking about attachment issues, object relations issues, uh, pre-verbal injuries. Now, the Grinch does go through a transformation. Hmm. And we might imagine, again from a Freudian lens, the Grinch's unconscious motives finally become conscious. And he becomes aware of what's happening and the superego kind of chimes in with a sense of morality. Mm -hmm. That as his heart grows, which gives him this enormous strength to lift up the whole sled and, you know, go forward, it also gives him a kind of moral potency so that he can say no to the part of himself that just wants to ruin everything, just wants to hurt everybody indiscriminately. Well, it's interesting to look at the Grinch uh, through these various uh, lenses of various theoreticians. You know, I think uh, Adler might say that that uh, the Grinch certainly displays huge power drive that's uh, compensatory to a denied inferiority complex. Absolutely. And Adler was also interested in the organic source of inferiority and we're told that Grinch's heart is in fact two sizes too small. Now, that could also be seen as a metaphor for any another any number of other organs that are undersized for Mr. <laughs> Grinch that leaves him feeling Back to Freud. particularly <laughs> uncomfortable and unhappy. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm still, I, I get it. I get it. And I, I think that he, his heart might have been too small because of early attachment issues. That's my guess anyway. You know, just when you were talking, I, I thought uh, something shook loose for me that I think is really uh, significant is, you know, the Grinch is trying to manage his disappointment and his negative emotions by imposing extraordinary constraints on outer reality. So he's uncomfortable with something, and rather than dealing with that in the inner world, he tries to make it so that outer reality will change to meet his needs. And of course, this is always a losing strategy. This is why one of the most important things when we're reaching for greater mental health is to learn acceptance. You know, we can't make Christmas go away. We have to, as they say in AA, accept life on life's terms. And uh, the Grinch, you know, starts with this. Someone said, I think it was um, Byron Katie says something like, if you argue with reality, you will always lose. And trying to make Christmas go away is like arguing with reality. So you're looking for the solution out there. You're trying to change the behavior of people around you instead of recognizing that this is all an inside job, that you need to come to terms with whatever's going on for you within you. And the distorted fantasy is if he's able to reshape reality, which, by the way, he is. He does this rather extraordinary superhuman feat of stealing every crumb, every bulb, every wire, every tree from this entire community. He's like the anti-Santa Claus. He's the anti-Santa and is able to spirit it away, which takes no small amount of determination and libido, by the way. The one thing I can say for the Grinch is that he's not depressed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's not like collapsed and mopey. No. He's really got some heat in his personality. And he has a bit of a superiority complex in the beginning because he really does think he can just steal the entire Christmas from the town, which in the beginning you might find questionable. But lo and behold, once he's set on that mission, he does in fact steal every tiny little crumb 
from the entire village, and in that way demonstrates to himself that he is, in fact, as powerful as he had fantasized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which, again, compensates for this misery and hypersensitivity that he has. But then what happens is it doesn't have the desired effect. Exactly. Joseph, do you want to go ahead and read the ending for us? So, the Grinch has triumphed. He's sure that he's not going to hear the Christmas noise. He doesn't have to smell their feasts, that they are all going to be as miserable as he has been for 53 years. Yeah, so he now, I'd like to say he's also having a midlife crisis. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so uh, there's one book. Uh, I love this line. The more the Grinch thought, I must stop this whole thing. Why, for 53 years, I put up with it now. And I just said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Grinch. He's 53. Oh, that explains <laughs> what's going on. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? So he's sure that the Who's down in Whoville are all going to cry boo-hoo. That's a noise, grinned the Grinch, that I simply must hear. So he paused, and the Grinch put his hand to his ear, and he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low, then it started to grow. But the sound wasn't sad. Why, this sound sounded merry. It couldn't be so, but it was merry, very. He stared down at Whoville. The Grinch popped his eyes, and he shook. What he saw was a shocking surprise. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same, and the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons, it came without tags, it came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say, that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. So he's a changed Grinch. He's a changed Grinch. And I love the image of the heart growing three sizes. Of course, it's a metaphor. But it also is a very concrete symbol that something structural inside of the Grinch has actually transformed, which also gives a sense that something permanent might actually have happened rather than just an ephemeral shift of mood, mm -hmm. but that his heart is new. That's also implied, Joseph, by the fact that in Whoville they say, so there's this sense of a kind of historic recounting so whatever changed that day was permanent, was it was enduring. So Joseph, you we went into this with you talking about how he responds to his failure, because as you point out, he was very successful in implementing this plan, but it didn't have the desired effect, because it's up there on Mount Crumpet, and they're all singing. And so it didn't work, and that was the transformative element you know, it reminds me of something that Winnicott says. He says that um, the baby has to destroy the mother. Well, just to um, take a step back here, Donald Winnicott was a British psychoanalyst, and he was a pediatrician. Uh, so he worked with children. What he means by, you know, the child destroying the mother is that the child, a toddler, let's say, will come at the mother with all his fury, all his venom, his 
anger of, you know, I hate you, and oh, da, 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 da. What he needs to see is that mom can stand her ground without retaliating uh, because this child is being so terribly bad, uh, or and without being defeated by it, without being so wounded and hurt. Uh, he needs to see that his negative affect does not have the effect of destroying or eroding a needed relationship with his primary caregiver, the mother. So when the mother can be calm and have herself be present and simply reflect back to the child, wow, you must be really angry right now, it feels to the child like he he can really be free to love mom. She's still there. I don't have dangerous, insidious powers after all. And that's what happens to our Grinch. Uh, He's destroyed. He thinks he's destroyed Christmas. And then there they are, Christmas morning, singing and holding hands and being joyful. And that's a huge turning point for the Grinch, that his negative affects, his hatred, resentment, greed, and envy, all the things we've talked about, didn't destroy the wonderful celebratory joy of Christmas. And then he is free to love the Who's and love Christmas. It's a liberating moment. And that kind of corrective experience can also happen in the analytic container, where perhaps the analyzand gets angry or expresses envy, and the analyst can stand his or her ground and meet it and survive it. And that is healing, because it it opens up a new possibility for real connection, because we, we can't really have connection with another unless we know that that person can withstand our strong negative feelings. So the Grinch's, you know, 50-some years of frustration and unmet needs finally surfaces to consciousness. He finally has access to this primal rage, this primal destructive energy in him, much the way a, a, a baby might in certain frustrated circumstances, and he finally yields and allows this primal affect to howl through him and is able to realize that it's actually safe for him to feel that much hatred and rage because it does not, in fact, destroy the world. Mm -hmm. And it does not destroy his capacity to be received and also does not destroy the possibility of redemption and restoration of the relationship. Mm -hmm. When we are all very young, we go through that process. We discover that our anger does not destroy the world, and consequently, feelings are safe, particularly when they remain in the realm of feelings and discussions and words and fantasy and fantasy but how how absolutely important that is for us to learn that as infants and that that primal emotion also fills him with power and energy he is an incredibly vital creature in all of that fervor so we know that the grinch had his heart grow three sizes as a result of this, and then what happened? And the minute his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light, and he brought back the toys and the food for the feast. And he, he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast So now he's able to have access to all of these things that he felt cut off from and shut out from. He also has the opportunity, although it's construed, to play the role of Santa Claus. So he comes back and is able to redistribute the things that he had taken, but also to restore the things he had broken 
to at least play the role of the one who gifts by returning these things, and in that way make an amends. And in the making of the amends, in the completion of the circle of the event, the hatred, the taking, the returning, and the restoring, that it then entitles the Scrooge to have a place at the table, to be in a relationship that he could not have had before. And if we think about the beginning of the story being about an incredible withdrawing, isolating psychology and the strange, almost psychotic foment that that causes versus him being in relationship, in community, and granting himself the right to both be generous and to restore the things that he had ruined allows him to become a new being. And perhaps in some way we all crave that, which is why the story is so enduring and so moving yeah, I think that's that's really lovely Be, because you know we've been talking about the Grinch uh, as as a potential analysand with a lot of issues, <laughs> but the truth is that we can all be Grinch-ish at times. We can all feel cut off from those things that we we want, but we won't even let ourselves know that we want. We can all feel that spoiling energy of wanting to take away another person's happiness. And we can all have these moments of redemption. So I think, I think the Grinch is us. Happy holidays, everyone. So maybe this is a time for us to transition to a dream. We'd all like to extend an invitation to all of the listeners to come to the website, thisjungianlife.com. J-U-N-G-I-A-N and on the front page you can click on podcast and there's a link to submit your dream for possible interpretation each week we cull through the dreams that are submitted and we pick one that we think will be helpful and useful for the listeners to lift up another aspect of dream interpretation that we hope is useful to all of you so we hope that you'll jump right in and participate in that, and that we'll hear from you. Our dreamer is a 24-year-old male who's a medical student. Here's his dream. Myself and my male housemate were on a train, being taunted by two teenage boys. The train stopped in the middle of a grassy clearing in the forest near a cliff face. As we were leaving the train, the two boys rudely brushed past us, and then I lost my temper and, in a heavily worded outburst, told them to get lost. They then ran away towards a corner of the cliff face. At that moment, an old man appeared from behind the train with a hunting rifle, who I felt was on my side. The old man was dressed as a hunter with a European hunting hat and had a dog following him. He chased after the boys and disappeared around the corner. When I caught up with them, the boys had run up to the top of a hill and were standing there with an old woman and a dog of their own. While we watched with the old man from the bottom of the hill, I somehow knew that the woman was the old hunter's wife of many years and that the two loved each other deeply. There was a brief standoff. Then suddenly, one of the boys took out a handgun and executed the wife, taunting the old man. Then he shot the old man's dog. The old man broke into tears of heartbreak, then retaliated by shooting the boy's own dog before vowing to get revenge on the boys themselves. My housemate and I were standing on the sidelines watching the conflict. I woke up feeling uneasy before either side won the coming battle. As a context, he tells us, This was one month ago during a very turbulent period in my life. It was during the last week of my final medical exams. 
My relationship with my girlfriend of two years was strained, and I was intensely deciding whether to end the relationship, something I had been conflicted over for several months. The next week, a few days after the final exam, I ended up breaking up with her. The next day she admitted to me that she was suffering from severe depression for many years and had hidden the extent of the illness from me while we were together. The depression was probably precipitated our relationship breakdown, though I still doubt whether we are compatible personalities and do not know what kind of a person she would have been without the illness. I took her to hospital and over the past three weeks I've been supporting her in her recovery, but we have remained apart. I've been moving on emotionally and feel hopeful and excited about my future alone, whereas she is still deeply wounded by the breakup and feeling hopeless, something which leaves me feeling a great deal of guilt. He writes that the main feelings in the dream were anger, followed by confusion and then anguish, and then he woke with a sense of foreboding. And then he adds, That week... I had several dreams about dogs dying as well as battles between groups of people which I do not remember well. This included a dream the night before of the dog my family had as a child dying, something which had devastated me when it happened in real life. There was also a dream where a young woman committed suicide, where people rebelled against an oppressive government that threatened all those who should want to do the same. The dogs in the dream were all small, white, and fluffy in appearance. Well, overall, I'm finding myself applying our famous maxim that comes from Pat Berry, that the least trustworthy attitude in the dream is that of the dream ego. And while it looks really reprehensible what these teenage boys do, I'm wondering if there isn't a kind of wisdom and purpose in it. I also find the presence of the dogs really interesting and the fact that they get shot because uh, one of the things we associate with dogs is loyalty. And so loyalty has been killed off here. And I have a hunch that that might be uh, in the interest of uh, psychological health for this dreamer. So he's you know, dutifully taking care of his ex-girlfriend who it seems like has really been struggling with something. And uh, he feels guilty about uh, moving on. As violent and destructive as the actions are, if they're not what is in fact required. I think uh, you're really right there on the right track, Lisa. And one of the feelings that he doesn't mention, he says anger, confusion, then anguish, and a sense of foreboding. But what I'm thinking about here is just grief of the, the sadness of uh, the relationship ending and uh, then all the events in the dream, especially uh, the killings, that the old woman dies and, and everybody's dogs die. And he says in his commentary that the dogs were all small, white, and fluffy, which is an indication of something very innocent uh, and something vulnerable. A very different image from, you know, say a mastiff or uh, some kind of hunting dog. So something young and innocent is what has been seemingly very violently annihilated. And this may be... Um, his own attitude uh, toward the woman that he's been with for two years and not having seen, despite the fact that he's in medical school and just graduating, uh, the extent of, of her depression, her mental illness, and perhaps that kind of relentless hope that things would work out, things would be okay, um, don't worry about this aspect of the relationship too much, Uh, And now the dream says it's dead. I find myself curious about the teenage boys. And I'm thinking about those teen years and the uninitiated young masculine. So these boys are full of a certain amount of aggression, 
sexuality, a kind of untempered redness in their personalities, as perhaps an aspect of the dreamer's psyche is also an untempered or uninitiated rawness of aggression, for instance. And that the uninitiated boys inside of him killed the wife. And he himself has stepped away from this relationship from his own spouse, so to speak, his partner, because she's ostensibly wasn't a good fit for him. But I wonder if the dream is pointing to another level of shadow, which can be very difficult for us to relate to because we're not aware of it and we don't associate ourselves with it on a conscious level. But what level of aggression is the dreamer negotiating with in order to end the relationship with the female partner, to kill off the kind of love or companionability or mammalian attachment even that the dog represents in service to something and we could go in two different directions in one way it could be a confrontation that the uninitiated masculine is running a bit rampant and is perhaps attacking the relationship to the feminine because the young men fear the feminine as a proxy of the mother that is going to trap them in a regressive and undeveloped place. And when men are very young, they will confuse the mother and the anima so that they feel that they have to disappear from a relationship because their female partners are carrying too much of the mother archetype. And if his partner was depressed, then she takes on even more of that archetypal level of the great mother to draw down, to collapse, to capture that the young masculine was refusing to be in relationship to or found excessively threatening. I'm going to pick up there, but possibly take it in a slightly different direction, because this is the kind of story and the kind of dream that I would expect to go along with a certain psychic constellation. So I'm going to be uh, (laughs) firing off uh, out of my kind of wild intuition here, just making up a story about this dreamer don't know, I don't know this, this is just pure speculation. But I'm going to guess that his mother was a little depressive or collapsed in some way. And that the dreamer felt has felt very connected with his mother, but that there's been something stifling about that connection. And it is not uncommon if we have that kind of constellation to repeat that in our relationships, in our romantic relationships. So if he had to somehow take care of his mother emotionally as a child, it's not surprising that we would wind up in a relationship with someone who needs emotional caregiving and is quite collapsed. I think, Joseph, what what you said that that's really helpful about the teenage boys, you know, adolescence is a time when we're busy separating from parents, And if you have that kind of constellation where you've always been an emotional caregiver for a parent, you may challenge that in adolescence. You might be full of piss and vinegar and be a little brat and say no and say horrible things. That's the time when we often do that. So it seems appropriate to me that it would be this adolescent energy that would assassinate the lover, as it were. You know, I find myself... Uh, thinking a lot about the polarity of these feelings, of of all this violence uh, in the dream, of the dream ego, first, you know, sort of yells at the two teenage boys, and then we have the annihilation, the assassination of the old woman and everybody's dogs. And then there's one part in this dream where he says the old man broke into tears of heartbreak, then retaliated by shooting the boy's own dog before vowing to get revenge. And I'm thinking about how the grief goes into this kind of 
of anger and action and the urge to eradicate, to get revenge, to shoot, to destroy. My thought about the dreamer, uh, who of course we don't know, but I'm taking a leap here, Mm -hmm. of how hard is it just to feel your feelings? Because the dream ego moves right off the heartbreak, which is really the heart of this dream, is the heartache. Instead, it's covered up by all the action and uh, drama and murderous violence of the dream. But underneath it is just a profound sadness. Yeah, it's a complex dream, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It really captures that bivalence, that depending on the lens we use, it's tragic. In another way, it can be developmental. In another way, it can bode some real confrontation with the violent shadow that has a certain kind of confusion around the anima and the mother and how that needs to be separated out so we know which to go after and which to protect. It's just a lot of of complicated material, which also seems appropriate at 24. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that transition towards establishing the kingdom. You know, the fellow's in medical school. He's still in this place where he's the student. He's the one who's being acted upon by the medical school as well as the various internships that he's in. Or let me take that back, Paul. The various residencies that he may be planning on, which again keeps him in a relatively powerless situation for a number of years and trying to carve out some access to his aggression so that he can harness that appropriately. The mistakes that we make as we're trying to get our hands on the controls of those powerful forces. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, Help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.